Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Breyer, and welcome to episode 62 of the 11FS FinTech Insider Breakfast Show. In this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the FinTech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight into your homes at 8.30 BST, here live on LinkedIn. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Mike Cunningham. Mike is the Chief Strategy and Digital Officer at Bank of Saudi Francie. I think I said that right, Mike, is, is that right? Yeah, Bank of Saudi Francie, that's right. Yeah. It. And on this morning's show, what we're going to be doing is talking about the Middle East and fintech space, digital transformation, and the fintech investment that really is new opportunities that Mike sees on the horizon. So good morning, Mike. How are you doing? Um, all well, thank you. Yeah, nice to be with you. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. No worries at all. Um, for everybody over on LinkedIn, as always, we love getting your questions. So feel free to drop them into the uh, the chat bar on the right hand side uh, and the team will pick them up. We'll weave them into the conversation and answer them as we go. So, I mean, Mike, tell us a little bit about your background, because I mean, we'll get to BSF in a second. But um, I mean, fintech is a space that you and your I mean, your team are very steeped in from a history perspective. So tell us a little bit about your background and, and what led you to, to BSF. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been a banker my entire career, uh, spent most of it at Barclays. Um, it's still a job that I absolutely love. I wake up every day completely pumped to do it. My wife thinks I'm a complete saddo because of it, but I genuinely believe banking is still one of the most interesting industries out there. Um, mm. I joined Barclays many, many moons ago as a graduate, spent 13 years with the firm in London. But then a lot of the time was also outside the country, um, focused on the emerging markets business. Mm -hmm. Probably the best stuff that I did there, I was given the task to lead the organic growth agenda for the bank um, and was fortunate enough to, to actually go and build three banks from scratch. Wow. Not digitally, very old school, bricks and mortar, but mm -hmm. I built Barclays India, I built Barclays in Pakistan, and then Barclays in Namibia. And then having kind of lived my life on a BA 747, Sue threatened to divorce me because I was never at home. Yeah. And that clearly wasn't the route that we wanted. So uh, along came uh, Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. Um, I moved out to Dubai, worked in Abu Dhabi, uh, headed strategy and innovation there. Um, what a roller coaster that was, right? So I kind of signed my contract with them in April 2008, sat out my notice period for six months landed into Abu Dhabi October 2008 and we all know what happened then right Lehman had gone every honestly it was just insanely difficult you know the the bank was by all intents and purposes kind of bankrupt mm. um you know imagine everything that you could have done to take maximum disadvantage from the financial crisis and that was us right yeah. fast forward 8 years later turn the bank around you know highest return on equity just an amazing kind of place to be learned more in those eight years than i did in my 13 at barclays i would say um but you know after you know continuing to try and push the digital agenda and people just thinking it was you know an app of what you know something on the iWatch or whatever you know that type of thing i've kind of had enough and needed to get that entrepreneurial urge out I went off and tried to build my own digital bank called Clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and we had everything, right? We had the right team. We had the right idea. We had the right value proposition, right tech. Big investors stood by, but it was all just at the wrong time. We were too early. You know, none of the regional regulators were willing to kind of engage in any form of license talks. When we went to banks to talk to them about kind of, you know, partnership opportunities, you know, what we could do on a bank as a service basis, every single one of them said, thanks, but you know what, you know, we can do it ourselves, right? And I think there was a bit of kind of, you know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, so probably saw us more as a threat than a, than an opportunity. Mm. Um, but, you know, not one of those banks that we engaged with in the last four years have moved forward to the level that, you know, that, that we believe they could have. So I think, you know, after two years of, trying to do my own thing with some great, great people, plundering every penny I had. It was time to get back and start kind of earning some money. Yeah. And so through my friends at kind of Bain and Company, I was introduced to BSF and uh, I've actually never looked back. Mm. It's been a, been a great ride so far. 
I mean, that's interesting. I mean, me and you first met each other when you were at Clearly. And, uh, and exactly as you say, it struck me like a great proposition, a really great team, uh, you know, a region that was uh, sort of underserved as well in terms of that market. So, I mean, it's like you say, timing sometimes is, it really is everything, isn't it? It is. Honestly, David, I, I, um, I, I genuinely believe, and, and look, it wasn't perfect. We made mistakes, but that's what you do in a startup, right? Yeah. And you learn from them. There are a few things that we definitely, definitely do different. But if we were doing it now, we'd be in a very, very different situation. I'm convinced mm -hmm. about that. But I yeah. wouldn't swap the experience for the world, even though it cost me a lot of money. Um, I look back with it very, very fondly. As stressful as it was, you know, the highs are high, but the lows are low. But uh, it was great and, and did learn a lot. Yeah. We took a lot from it. I mean, the thing when you've got a great team, right, you, uh, you succeed as a team. Um, but when things aren't going so well, you you fail as a team as well, yes. right? You know, everybody Absolutely. really pulls around and actually is in a situation where that happens. And that's that's great. I mean, tell us a little bit more about BSF then, because obviously, I mean, talking of that team, some of those people who were with you uh, at Clearly and now at BSF as well, right? Yes, they are. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so BSF, uh, thanks to some M&A activity last year where the oldest bank actually got bought out, we're now actually the oldest bank in, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, so a JV between Credit Agricol and some investors in Saudi, although Credit Agricol have all but exited um, um, the, you know, the, you know, the shareholding now. And we're probably, if you look at us from a corporate wholesale type perspective, we're probably number two uh, in terms of size in the kingdom. Um, on a universal level, uh, because we, you know, we don't have much kind of retail stuff. We slip down the, you know, the charts a little bit, but we serve wholesale all the way from SME through to large corporates on the consumer side. We don't really go after mass, although we will. And there's there's some stuff that, that that's going on behind the scenes around that. But we tend to be mass affluent, affluent. We've got a very very strong private bank, and we've also got our own investment bank. In terms of scale, we've got probably about $50 billion on each side of the balance sheet. We've got a market cap of just shy of 40 billion US. And we each year we tend to have a net income of around a billion dollars. So it's a it's a relatively uh, healthy business. Mm. We've had big investors come in from the US, big private equity fund, which is great. Shows the, you know, the belief in the kingdom, shows the belief in the management team that we've got. And I genuinely believe it is a it's a it's an unpolished diamond. It's great, don't get me wrong, but I think there's so much opportunity. And and you know, despite being that really old bank, we've got such a young workforce, right? Over seventy percent of our staff, and there's probably about two and a half thousand colleagues. Um, I'm actually one of the oldest that are there at the grand old age of forty seven. You know, it's uh, over seventy percent a millennial. Um, very, very young, and it's just a joy and a pleasure to be surrounded by those kind of people. Well, and, and as we were saying, I mean, when when it, when timing is such a key ingredient, then I mean, the 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 region from a fintech, from a changes from a regulatory perspective, from a uh, you know opportunities, and as you say, the even the expectations of the workforce. I mean, the the timing is right for for pretty big changes. That you know, the fintech scene out there is is coming alive, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, hundred percent. You know, it's um, it, it's one thing that's really struck me with the people of Saudi, how willing to change they are, how much they want change, ready to roll their sleeves up. You know, let's get out, kind of, uh, you know, show the world what Saudi's really about. Because unfortunately, you know the you know the images of Saudi that come from CNN and BBC don't really show what it's like there. Um, mm. And uh, it's changing massively, it really is. It's uh, such an exciting region to be in. Fantastic. And obviously, I mean, you're not there right now. I mean, we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic, everything that's happened with COVID-19. Um, how has that affected you guys and, and your operation? Uh, obviously, you you live in the UK, but travel. <laughs> so so the, the, the setup of that must be quite difficult, I guess, moving to, I mean, there's remote and then there's really remote, I guess, in terms of the, the team. So how has that affected you and, and the, the work that you're doing right now? Do you know what? It's um, it's actually been a really easy migration for us. Um, I, I think I can honestly say that we haven't skipped a beat. We're busier than ever. We're as productive as ever. 
you know, we were already kind of working with remote teams. You know, we've been doing a lot of work with with, with you guys, David, um, out of London. So there's always that bit bit of a kind of a, a time difference. So we're used to that. Um, we've always been working in this kind of agile and very independent fashion. You know, we we tooled the team up uh, properly. You know, from from day one when I arrived. <clears throat> so we've all MacBooks, G Suite, Slack, WebEx. We're all ready to kind of do this. And honestly. You know, our culture rocks, right? You know, people know what's expected of them, that we know they know that we're focused on outcomes as opposed to what time they show up from the office, where they are, you know, all of those kind of old ways of managing performance are, are not the same. And I'm actually really proud of the team that they've just been able to, to you know, to nail this, right? Yeah. It's, um, you know, but honestly, I said to you earlier when we first jumped on the call, I'm ready to get back and see people and give them a hug, right? I'm, I'm really missing it. I'm just so WebExed out at this point in time. Uh, do you know what I've yeah. said to a few, few a few people? It's um, it, a sp particularly when you're in a you know leadership role. Actually, you feel slightly like a, a general behind enemy lines, don't you? You want to be yeah. there with the team and <clears throat> and helping people. But uh, it it is an interesting one when you uh, you know you talk about the uh, the impact of this and the uh, the focus. I mean, I, I'm a, uh, me and you've talked about this before, Mike, but I'm a real big believer in, I mean, I don't care when anybody does does the work. I care that they care. Yeah. Uh, if you instill that belief in people, people take ownership of the thing that they're doing. Um, and actually, I mean, this is, uh, I think, a problem with remote uh, more broadly is, uh, and it's not just work. I think actually, I mean, schools are in a very similar situation. I was having this conversation with my wife yesterday. It's like remote teaching for schools the key ingredient is that the kid needs to, wants to learn. Uh, yeah. Remote working for any business, the key thing is not, you know, uh, a webcam or, you know, good keyboard or a desk. It's that people take responsibility for their work. And if they take responsibility for their work and the organization trusts them to do that, then everything works perfectly. And I, and this is, you know, these are the fruits that come to bear is uh, is when you trust your people and your people trust you. So it's, um, Couldn't it's good agree to more. see. Couldn't agree more. So, I mean, obviously, like um, like we said, in terms of the, the region when you first went there, um, digital wasn't high on the agenda. But but for you guys, I mean, accelerating that digital transformation agenda is is something that's pretty high up on your strategy, isn't it? Pretty high up on the agenda. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. We've, um, you know, our ambition around digital is is big and bold. Um, you know, just from a regional and, and certainly from the kingdom's perspective, we want to be front and center of that. Um, we want to build stuff that's that's as good as what Monzo does. We want to do world first. We uh, we've managed to be able to attract amazing talent, you know, to come and participate in this and. Uh, we're also ready to kind of try and break some norms uh, in terms of how we partner with fin with fintech. You know, we're looking at investments, and we've made a couple of investments in fintech uh, already. So we've got we've got big, big, big plans around this, and uh, there's a lot to come. A lot to come. I promise. Sounds exciting. Have, have Have you seen? I mean, during this period, the uh, with everything that's happening with COVID, have you seen customers' behaviour change? Because obviously, with lockdowns and restrictions uh you know again the 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 pendulum swings to the digital agenda so so dramatically doesn't it yeah absolutely so i think you know i'm, I'm sure you know all banks are seeing the same so you're seeing drawdowns on credit lines from corporate customers a lot quicker um i think you're seeing less spending a lot more kind of you know digital or engagement with the digital channels um less cash less branch traffic and and honestly i genuinely believe that you know consumer behavior is going to change forever after this you know banking you know how to use it you realize that you know the cash is is dirty and generally sucks why would you ever kind of want to go back it's like me when i move from windows to, to mac i never want to go back and, and touch a windows machine it's exactly the same with this and you know you know I, I i genuinely believe that the only reason why people go out and use branches is because we make them you know and i think you know it taking the advice bit to one side 
who wants to go to a branch? I mean, have you ever been to this region in July? You know, who wants to take on Riyadh traffic in the summer heat, fight to find a parking kind of space to go and deposit a check? Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. And the only reason people do it is because we don't give them any other options today. And that, I think, together with the regulator, it's our fault and it's our responsibility to fix. So, um, you well, know, I think I think there's a place for, for that human bit on the advisory side. But in terms of physical location, I'm convinced they're, they're on the way out. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, definitely there's a there's a real uh, inflection point, isn't there now? I think to your point, people have been um, branch <laughs> and everything have been such a safety net for such a long period of time, hasn't it? But the yeah. their function ha has been replaced in many. I think the, the difficulty with that, and, and again, me and you've talked about this before, is um, many people have implemented digital in a way that takes away this human or, or, or rather not not the physical human but takes away the humanity of the interaction um and digital can do so much more than that it doesn't have to be sterile it doesn't have to be yeah. uh, generic it could be so much richer so much bizarrely so much more human than humans in many instances because 24 7 service you know everything that can kind of come with that so um i, I you know big believer that um digital is best when you do it in a way that creates humanity that it communicates effectively that it brings all of these things together um so and i know that's uh, like i say is very high up in your agenda some some really interesting questions for you over on linkedin so i'll ans ask you a, a, a few of these um sure. from one from steve brown what do you see as the biggest opportunities on the near horizon for saudi fintech uh, obviously there's lots of different sort of uh, strings to that bow in terms of retail or commercial or uh, payments or, you know, PFM or, you know, open banking as a, as a topic. So, you know, there's lots of opportunity there, but are you seeing any particular areas where that's um, really catching fire? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, there's probably a couple of areas, certainly at Bank Saudi Francie that we focus on. Um, one of them is, you know, you know, looking for fintechs that can help reduce our cost of acquisition our cost of service, you know, if we can find fintechs that can kind of deploy balance sheet for us a lot more efficiently, um, you know, manage that risk potentially better than we can, uh, then very, very interested in that type of thing. You know, our, our operating models traditionally are bulky, expensive to run. <clears throat> and, you know, with us being able to deploy balance sheet on a wholesale basis, through different channels makes a, a you know a real kind of sensible kind of move towards that mm. um we're still getting to grips with with big data um you know artificial intelligence data science we know it's something that we have to do we're just starting to invest in it we're building a team around there but i think you know coming to us with you know ideas around how we can better service customer how we can better cross sell how we can manage risk better um, you know, is it is a is something that all of the banks will undoubtedly be uh, be very interested in. Mm. I think on you know on the open banking side, um, not much is happening. Uh, if I had to bet bet money, I would say that Sama, our regulator, who's awesome, um, in on the whole, uh, will probably be the first to come out. Bahrain. Uh, have has done something so they partnered with an awesome company i'm sure you know them called token yeah. um to to get open banking up and running there but it's a relatively small you know uh, area and if you look at in that uh, you know wider across the region there's only really saudi and egypt that are that are scale markets and the ones that are really interesting mm -hmm. out of all of them um but we're ready to do the open banking stuff we're excited about it we see the opportunity you know, as a, you know, we're not, we, we don't fear it at all. We want to embrace it. Mm. Um, we want to be able to help uh, FinTech, you know, bank as a service, all of this type of stuff, how we monetize our APIs. It's all things that we are thinking about right now. It's not mm. there yet, but it's all on the plan. It's coming, yeah. I mean, again, that's a, a a mindset, isn't it? You're either on defense or you're on offense. And actually, yeah. like, if you're always looking for those opportunities, you know. Uh, a question here, actually, from LinkedIn was uh, from Bavin Shaw. Um, Mike, what kind of change in mindset 
particularly talking about that again, uh, did you need to move from a traditional banking environment to fintech and then I guess back to banking as well? You know, how, how have you uh, been able to sort of traverse both sides of that, uh, that divide? Yeah, so I think, um, I don't think I would have joined BSF if I hadn't been able to, to retain that entrepreneurial mind, mindset and to, to really start like a think up, uh, start, think like a startup, sorry. You know, we, um, you know, we care a lot about cost. We care a lot of about, you know, kind of agility, getting things to market quickly. And, you know, when I was interviewed by, by my boss, Rayan, and by board members and the chairman, you know, it was, it was a one, some of the stuff that I really talked about that we needed. Um, trying to get the board to think like venture capitalists is, is very, very difficult. It hasn't been easy, but they're getting there now. They know that we need to place selective bets. Not all of them are going to come off, mm. but some of them will come off big. And I think, you know, keeping that entrepreneurial spirit, that drive to deliver, no fear of failure, um, you know, is it, it's something that, uh, that's that, that's allowed me to go back to big banking away from uh, for, away from a startup. Mm. Um, if that hadn't have been there, I wouldn't I wouldn't be at Bank Saudi Francie. But uh, we get that flexibility; it's great. And sometimes, you know, I, I kind of just do stuff and and beg forgiveness after. Um, I never kind of break any regulatory rules before anyone from Sama starts to kind of call <laughs> my boss. But you know, internally, sometimes we we, we just got to get on with stuff, and we and we beg forgiveness. But we well, never it, do anything that, 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 that you know, no one's going to die, right? It's, yeah, uh, it's not it like we're messing with that. them. Well, it comes back to that point around trust as well, doesn't it? Uh, you know, actually, if you've created that that trust and and actually shared belief, I mean, I, I eleven FS, I always talk about uh, positive intent. Uh, when you've got that trust and you presume positive intent from everybody in terms of what they're doing, then uh, things will go right, things will go wrong. But uh, yeah. you know that they had the the right uh, the right mindset when they were trying to do something. But uh, another another good question for you here. So uh, Sajid Bokhari, which is Saudi Arabia is making significant investment to become a world leader in particularly in Islamic finance. Uh, how is BSF seeking to take advantage of that? I mean, is, Islamic finance obviously, I mean, globally has been so on. We again, we always talk about underserved and overcharged and <clears throat> underserved for such a, a very large period of time. But is that some an area that you guys will be taking a bit of a look at? Yeah. So you know, just by design, Islamic finance, you know, it, it, it's just come to be expected. For me, it's the utility piece. You don't need to shout about it. People just expect everything that you do to be Sharia compliant, right? It's not a reason why people want to necessarily bank with you anymore. It should be just just what it is. That said, something that we found very, very interesting was that, you know, when we started to talk to, you know, the 16 to maybe 25, 30 population, they actually said, look, you know, we don't see Islamic banking as being um, as being all it's cracked up to be. We just see it as a reason why you can charge us more money because it does cost more to do Islamic finance, right? There's so much operational stuff that you know that goes behind the scenes. So you know, th th there's a lot in the younger segment. There's a lot of kind of suspicion when it's Islamic and am I just paying more money for the sake of this? And some people say, look, you know, the minute you give me a loan be it you know you, you're, you're charging me profit rates instead of interest mm -hmm. we're both going to hell right so you know let, let's just call it as it is yeah um so th there's a bit of a shift there but obviously everything that we do you know we focus around those islamic and sharia uh, principles and the, you know certainly the new propositions that we have will just as designed be be islamic yeah, mm. yeah and and actually i mean having uh looked at that a lot a lot closer like you say it's it's um uh there are there are standards there are principles and a lot of those standards and a lot of those principles 
should really be applying much broader to, to, to banking more generally, which is which is really interesting. Um, another good question here for you, uh, Deval Gore uh, from London and Partners uh, said, uh, have you seen many UK fintechs setting up in KSA or is Dubai the base in which you see that happening a little bit more in the, the wider sort of regional context? Um, I, obviously there's such a big trend of UK fintechs sort of moving out of uh, uh, out of the UK, looking for really, uh, if I'm honest, bigger geographies or bigger customer bases to serve. Um, have you seen any of that happening in uh, in KSA yet? Yeah, so so no, not yet. I think there are a number of uh, kind of UK and international fintechs wanting to come to Saudi now. We've got to make it easier for them to do business. We've got to make it easier for them to kind of employ expats instead of you know you know the majority being kind of uh you know saudi national so there's some things i think as a as an economy that uh, that we would need to focus on dubai is still a very easy place as a brit to go and live operate in and and kind of do business but it's really bloody expensive as well it's not a place for uh, for startups um compared to 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 to, to other areas um, and I think, you know, as a as a Saudi bank, we don't want to just see people kind of flying in, doing a bit of stuff with us and then going out. We want to see people investing in the kingdom alongside us to show that, you know, that, that you know, they're here for the for the long haul. Um, mm. But again, like I said, we've just got to make that easier for them. So uh, so more to follow. You know, we've had transfer wise, uh, you know, show up. We've had. Um, Revolut that are poking around now, probably more in the UAE, but obviously, like I said, Saudi is bloody huge compared to you know to the to all of the other markets. Mm-hmm. Fedor have been around selling their tech, um, but most of it is homegrown, and it's great to see homegrown where they're taking you know proven models from the Far East, from the West. But doing you know some form of hyper localization on the proposition, and uh, it's it's great to see. It really is great to see. Well, that's awesome. I, I mean, we're rapidly running out of time. Being a little bit on this period, and <clears throat> um, that's happened from a crisis perspective. I mean, how how do you think that will shape? BSF's mission going forward is this is this a uh, is this a an accelerant? Do you think for the things that you've been looking to do, or uh, or do you think things will be um, di- um, sort of disrupted a little bit more uh, in this period? So I I fully expect more disruption in this period, but in terms of our mission, it's unchanged from what it was before crisis. You know, our you know it's a very banking mission, but you know we want to be the most innovative and experience focused bank in the region. And what that means is we want to be front and center for digital. We want to build stuff that's as good as anything that comes out of London or the Valley or Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, as as a bank and as a bunch of people, we're so committed, we're fiercely proud, you know, determined in our mission and honestly, get ready, you ain't seen anything yet. You know, you know, people that know me will say that, you know, all that Mike ever says is go big or go home. And that is Bank Saudi Francy and our digital aspiration, David. Very exciting. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to let everybody go and get on with their day. But uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thanks Um, for having me. People learn a little bit more about you and the great work that you're doing at BSF. Awesome. Yeah, they can always find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on there. So very happy to uh, to take questions and intros. Yeah, be brilliant. Fantastic. All right, guys, uh, that's all that we have for you today. But we will be back tomorrow with Simon Torrance, who is an advisor and author of some super awesome books, actually. New Growth Playbook and a, a really interesting book called Fight Back. So we're going to get him on to talk about what they are uh, and actually what he's seeing in the market right now. So that's all we have for you today. We will see you same time, same place tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. Goodbye.